Okay. Uh, good morning. It's a great honour to be here um, in, a, in a group of such uh, distinguished speakers and in a room that's big enough for Bruce Springsteen, I think. Um, so I was going to, um, the previous speaker kind of um, led nicely into this. I was going to talk a bit about this correlation he showed that we found and why I think it's important uh, beyond uh, telling us about the variability in the system. So this session's about uh, annual to millennium, millennial scale uh, carbon cycle, and uh, my argument will be that the short-term uh, constraints gives us information on the long-term sensitivity, and that's what I mean by an emergent constraint. So this thing here, is it like that clicker? That's the light. Oh, the big button, the big A button. Where is that? The big green button. Oh, the big green one. Thanks. Yeah. yeah you, you, you might not trust my carbon cycle modeling after that. Um, okay, so just to set this up, this is uh, the uncertainty in current carbon cycle simulations, which is kind of motivating a lot of what I'm doing. And this is from actually the simplest simulation you can imagine running. So 1% per year increase in CO2, no land use change. And this just shows the change in the land carbon storage in petagrams or gigatons of carbon from a coupled simulation. That means where there are climate change effects on the carbon cycle and from an uncoupled simulation. I'm going to try and do the pointer here. Um, and you'll notice that the ranges are huge in terms of the extra carbon storage simulated by the end of the century to the point where um, it's getting slightly embarrassing, actually. So what can we do about that? This is uh, from uh, the IPCC, last IPCC report, showing the estimates of uncertainties in the various components of the overall carbon cycle response to climate change. So changes in CO2 affecting fertilization and ocean uptake, that's in the middle panel. And at the bottom, the response is to climate. And what you'll notice here is that um, the largest responses, uh, the largest uncertainties are still in the land response to CO2, um, which I'm not going to talk so much about, and in the land response to climate. And this is especially true in the tropics, which is the, the subject of my talk. Or at least I'm going to give you an example from the tropics. The point I'm trying to make here is more general than that, I hope which is that there are relationships between variability and sensitivity that we can use to constrain the future. Okay, so basically this is attacking what you might call the time scale problem in the evaluation of Earth system models. We want to know what's going to happen to the Earth system over the next century. That's what we're being asked to do. But we actually only have data um, on much shorter time scales. And typically what we do uh, as a community of climate scientists and Earth system modelers is we even get rid of the variability and say, I'm looking for trends, so I'm going to throw away the variability, it's just noise. And that sort of throws away nearly all the information, I think. So what else can we do? So why would we expect variability and sensitivity to be related? There are a few reasons for this. Some of them are hard and theoretical, some of them are straightforward, so I'm mainly going to deal with the straightforward ones. Um, uh, to begin with, um, we have conservation laws in the climate system. So, for example, if we're interested in changes in the storage on land, like that figure I showed you, the second one, it will be driven in part by changes in fluxes. That's because there are conservation laws that link the rate of change uh, of a store to the fluxes. So if you look at sensitivity of fluxes, you often get a reasonable estimate of sensitivity of stores. And then there are deeper theoretical reasons that physicists talk of, and um, you know, this is what Einstein got his Nobel Prize for, not relativity, but this sort of stuff, is the relationship between fluctuations and sensitivity through things like the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Now, there are lots of caveats about how you apply this, but I'm kind of using it as a motivation for what I'm trying to do. An even simpler way to think about this is to think about um, a simple kind of conceptual model of stability uh, in an equilibrium, and we might imagine a, uh, an equilibrium that's represented by the ball at the bottom of a well. If it's a stable equilibrium, the sides of the well will be quite steep, and there will be a small sensitivity to forcing. So this is the basis of the sensitivity we're interested in, and there will be equally short and fast oscillations. Okay, so uh, basically a, a, short, a, a small autocorrelation um, between the, the variability and a, sh a smaller variability overall variance. But if we have a less stable equilibrium, which is represented by a more shallow bowl, then we get a larger sensitivity to forcing, and we get longer and slower oscillations. And actually, the difference between the, the, the two curves on the right is what people use to try and detect tipping points. It's a hard problem, really. That's basically saying, can we detect from changes in variability, changes in sensitivity? 
And when the sensitivity becomes infinitely large, that's when this, this bowl becomes flat, we have a tipping point. But how about if we did the simpler thing and just say, well, given that, let's assume the bowl change, it's got the same shape the whole time, can we use this, the variability to tell us how steep the sides of the bowl are, and therefore how the sensitivity to forcing works? And that's the basic idea. So this would be complicated fluctuation dissipation theorem if I could do it, but it's simple balls in a bowl because I can't. Okay, so emerging constraints then. This is a concept that's become more common. I didn't invent it, but I think it's a real cool thing. Um, so basically, the idea is you use Earth system models to identify relationships between observable variability and future sensitivity. And sometimes this is used in a slightly more trivial way, which is to say, is the trend we observe to date related to the trend we predict to the future? I think there's something deeper in this when you look at sensitivity. Okay. So it's emergent because it emerges from the ensemble of Earth system model projections. We aren't we aren't accepting that any one model is correct, but rather where there is consistency between short-term and long-term across the ensemble, we're going to believe it. And uh, it's a constraint because it enables an observation of the short-term variability to constrain the estimate of the Earth system sensitivity in the real world. This makes an assumption that where models agree, and they don't agree on much, we believe them. Okay, so I'm sure there'll be questions on this, but it's quite a common assumption to make. They, it's rare to get models agreeing on a relationship. When they do, I think it's robust. And the last speaker gave a lead into this, but I'll explain why we got excited by it. So we published something in Nature in 2013 on this issue of uh, what is an emergent constraint on carbon loss from tropical land under climate change, associated with CO2 variability um, from year to year. Okay, this is the basic problem. So this is from the last generation models, the so-called C4 MIP models. They are on my third graph where I had a bar chart showing uncertainties, but they're the last generation models. This is the loss of carbon in gigatons of carbon from tropical land per degree of warming in the tropics. And in the blue, we have C4 MIP models um, of various types. And in red, we have three variants of the Hadley Center model that produced Amazon dieback. And these differ just through land surface parameters, things like optimum temperature for photosynthesis especially. So on the right hand side you see diff three different variants of physically the same model. In fact the same model structurally, just slightly different optimum temperatures for photosynthesis. But the range is huge. It goes from models that might release just due to climate change 30 gigatons per Kelvin to 200. In most of these models there's a strong CO2 fertilization effect that's counteracting this. But so we've just isolated the temperature effect and there's another message in that. Uh, we shouldn't expect to get everything out of variability. Obviously, you're not going to see things in variability that are not um, influencing the variability. And CO2 from year to year, although it has an impact in the long term through CO2 fertilization, does not have a significant impact on the fluxes. So we just want to isolate the climate response here. So how can we constrain the sensitivity? And this is something that the last speaker showed. Um, there is this quite strong correlation between the anomaly and the growth rate of CO2 for example, at Mauna Loa, and the anomaly in the tropical temperature. And here we're doing something very simple. We're taking anomalies from 30 north to 30 south. Um, it's especially the case where you have El Nino-driven variability. It fails when you have volcanic changes where other impacts operate that aren't temperature-related or precip-related through ENSO. Some of this is, is not, this does not, this does not show that the only driver is temperature, but rather that in the tropics, where the, temperature where the CO2 variability is mostly influenced from year to year. The temperature change and the precip change are correlated through El Nino. And this was also shown, if we take just the observations, we can plot the anomaly against the tropical temperature. What I've got marked in red here are volcanic years or years after major volcanoes that affected climate and which we didn't expect to be on the line and which are not. So we take them out. It doesn't make a huge difference to the fit. So you might say that's not a great fit, but actually it's useful because the models vary so much. And there is a range here, a sensitivity of the CO2 growth rate to temperature, uh, which is about 5.1 gigatons of carbon per year per degree of warming. We're not the first people to do this. I mean, there's the various ways to do this. But you can use it as a constraint on models. Because models calculate the same thing, right? Um, they may be imperfect, but they do have internal consistency between fluxes, we hope, and between stores. And they have variability that is driven by their own internal variability. So if we do the same thing for models, so we calculate the same thing, we find the bar chart below. So now it's, it's gigatons of carbon per year per Kelvin. So the anomaly in the CO2 growth rate, the annual CO2 growth rate, 
sensitivity to temperature in the tropics, and they are remarkably similar. And we knew we had a result then. Didn't really understand it, but we knew we had a result. Um, so there is basically a very strong correlation in these models between the, very, the, the sensitivity of their CO2 growth rate to tropical temperature and what they predict for the future. And the reason for that, in a hand-waving sense, is because uh, the change in the carbon storage in the future is essentially indicative of a change of the carbon balance and the carbon fluxes, which you can see from year to year. And here's the observed. So that's the trick. It becomes an emergent constraint because we can observe the lower one. We would like to be able to observe the upper one, but we'll have to wait for 100 years and it'll be too late. But we can observe the lower one, and we can get a constraint on the upper one. And that's essentially what we did. So we're now plotting the long term, the climate impact. That's the amount of carbon released from the tropics per degree of warming, and then we've got the sensitivity of the CO2 growth rate. And these, these letters uh, represent the five, um, uh, the six C4 MIP models that I showed you. We calibrated against those, and then we tested against the HADCM3 models where we'd fiddled with the parameters in various ways, and they fitted beautifully on the line. So there is a robustness here um, that I think is genuine. And we also see it in CMIP5, which I'll touch on very shortly. Okay, so what do you do with that now? So now we've got our constraint from the observations. We've got some estimate of how good this straight line is. Uh, and even I can do the stats here. You can work out from the um, uncertainty on the x-axis and the uncertainty on the straight line, the uncertainty on the y-axis. Okay, so this is what we would have got for the climate impact, the warming impact on the tropics if we'd assumed all models in the C4 MIP uh, uh, ensemble were equally likely to be true. It's very broad. It includes these very large minus figures that my model was responsible for, where the Amazon forest died under climate change. If we put in this constraint, we get a much tighter constraint. It's, about, it's still significant. It's 50 gigatons of carbon loss per degree of warming. But that is generally counteracted in these models by CO2 fertilization. So a big issue now is CO2 fertilization big enough to counteract that. And this is where the diabet was. So we've got a, a useful constraint by relating variability to sensitivity using the model ensemble. Okay, and this was uh, repeated by uh, Sabrina Wenzel for the CMIP5 models. So these are the C4 MIP models, same diagram uh, and the same constraint. The CMIP5 models, there is one model that doesn't fit here, and it's a kind of cautionary tale. Is this one uh, on the left? Um, that model has a respiration, to come back to the previous speaker, that is a respiration, soil respiration that depends predominantly on moisture. And there's a decoupling between the relationship between moisture and temperature in the future that means the relationship doesn't work. It also doesn't have a very good estimate of current variability. So the other thing is we essentially have a, uh, we have a metric for model performance here for the current day that is related to the, um, the future loss of carbon, which is often a problem. Interestingly, you get a very similar constraint for these two sets. The lines are different. Um, we're still trying to work that out. I think that's related to the nature of the CO2 scenario that we apply. But we also get a very similar constraint around 50 gigatons of carbon per Kelvin. Okay. So the intermanual variability provides a very similar constraint for C4 MIP and CMIP5. Even models with nitrogen limitation um, fit on the CMIP5 line. Um, this may be because in the tropics, nitrogen limitation is not a big deal. Uh, it's probably indicative more generally of the fact that even in those models, sensitivity of the fluxes is, is indicative generally of sensitivity of the stores. Okay, and I'm going to conclude. Um, so climate carbon cycle feedbacks are now routinely included in our system models, and INES, amongst others, was, was uh, um, fundamental in getting that done. We've now got to the point where land carbon feedbacks are a major source of uncertainty in future projections, which is both good and bad. I'm pleased they're in the model. I'd quite like it if we weren't the biggest unknown <laughs> sometimes. Um, they're not as, uh, you know, they're in, on, on, a, on a par with cloud feedbacks, I think, now in terms of uncertainty. The problem we have often is that we want to know sensitivity of the system on long time scales when we've got short term data. And that's where this notion of emerging constraints, I think, is extremely promising. And that's basically saying that models are good enough to tell you the relationship between the short term and the long term. And that basically means you can use them to interpret a, an observation of variability now in terms of future sensitivity. We found an emergent constraint that relates the future loss of tropical land carbon to the intranual variability of CO2 in both the C4 MIP and C MIP5 models. It gives a very similar constraint. Um, and I think there's a possibility of many other emergent constraints in the climate system. We may have been lucky here. This may be an unusually simple system, but I suspect not. I think if we find the right 
variability and we interpret the models in the correct way, they can tell us something useful as an ensemble that they can't, any one model, however good, can't tell us on our, on our own. So defining that emergent relationship actually requires you need a whole range of models to do it. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Can you comment on the role of, um, in the ocean biogeochemical case, there didn't seem to be such a, a complete uh, relationship there, yet it also seems that often the ocean biogeochemical models and those of land terrestrial sort of calculated independently of each other. Can you comment on the role of that longer term storage and how it might impact those emergent constraints in terms of total land ocean? Cycle. Yeah, so um, I didn't mention the um, ocean storage in part because of my own biases, but also because the um, uncertainty, you may remember the third plot I showed, is much smaller. That isn't to say I don't believe there are emergent constraints. The issue with the ocean, though, is that the time scales are typically much longer. So you, you wouldn't expect, I don't think, to see everything you need to see in the fluxes because of the, the multiple time scales and long time scales to work out the change in storage. But there are aspects of the ocean that I would expect to see emergent constraints. They're generally fast things, like I'd expect um, the marine biology, chlorophyll variability to relate in some sense to the, the, uh, the chlorophyll sensitivity to future change. And I don't think that's been looked at yet, but I think that that might work even better. If you basically have got a fast system, um, you would expect to see uh, ind indications in variability, short-term variability, that are indicative of long-term changes in in sensitivity. And if you've got a slow system, you'll only get a bit of it. So I think it should work, but only for parts of the ocean problem. Peter, what happens if you take into account the extra tropics? Does it screw up the picture completely? Um, it would do, actually. So, so this is a case in point where you, you need um, some measurement that, uh, well, some interpretation of measurement that allows you to isolate part of the system. So for many years, and I actually published a paper on this, I thought you could use the interannual variability to get a constraint on the overall carbon cycle feedback. And that was just being too greedy. I mean, basically, the, the CO2 variability we know is caused by the tropical land, so you would expect it to constrain the tropical land, but not the extra tropics. Other things, like variability in the CO2 seasonal cycle, may well do in a more, rather more complicated way, and, that, and people are looking at that now. But it is a question you sort of need to know enough about the system to know how not to overinterpret the data, I suppose. Uh, and, and looking for strong correlations. I, I do think this has to be a kind of hypothesis testing thing where you go there with a view, uh, a view to what you might expect to find between sensitivity and variability. Otherwise, if you do data mining, I think you can get spurious results. But there will be relationships there. It's just you need to inform them by your understanding. <laughs> 